Hello, and welcome to the 14th episode of Season 2 of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend, and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Well, hello, Ray. And we're ready for part four of the Deutsche Bank story. Part four? Uh, We were only going to do three parts. Uh, Well, so was Douglas Adams, and look where that got him. Uh, Fame, fortune, and an early demise? Uh, Well, as long as there's the fame and fortune, I can live without the other. Uh, Frankly, Ray, I'd just settle for the fortune, but there you go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, fair enough. Uh, back to the point, Graham. Um, what are we going to cover today? Well, Ray, in our last episode, we said we were going to look at the recent history of Deutsche Bank to try and get some understanding of what led them to the series of unfortunate events of the past few years. Yes, and we realised when putting this episode together that Deutsche Bank are no strangers to controversial decisions, nor to flirting with significant risk. Exactly. So I think we can tell their history as a drama in three acts. Oh, I agree. Act one, the acquisition of Morgan Grenfell. Act two, the acquisition of Bankers Trust. And act three, the relationship with Donald Trump. Hmm. Um, I think most people will be aware of the somewhat controversial nature of the Deutsche Bank-Trump relationship, but I wonder, Ray, how many of our listeners will be aware of the equally contentious backgrounds to the other two purchases? Well, I've no idea, but but fewer than there will be in about 20 minutes. (laughs) Good point, yeah. So, come on, let's get cracking then. Uh, Yes, and we'll begin with Morgan Grenfell. Um, I suspect not many people will know that the bank was started by the American George Peabody, who's better known around these parts as the father of modern philanthropy. Do you know, I didn't know that until we embarked on the research, although oddly I used to see his statue every day when I was working in the City of London because it's right next to the Royal Exchange by Bank Underground Station. It's a marvellous statue. Um, mm. and, and now he's mostly known for founding the Peabody Trust, which was one of the first housing associations dedicated to providing decent housing for the poor, and which today has around 55,000 properties across London and South East England. Yes, and alongside the Guinness Foundation, it's one of the largest providers of social housing in the entire country. I hold that thought, Graham. We'll come back to the uh, Guinness family in a minute. Okay. But to pick up our story, um, Peabody teamed up with Julius Spencer Morgan, uh, who eventually took over the running of the bank, changing its name to J.S. Morgan & Co. Um, yes, and I believe their New York agency became in time J.P. Morgan after Julius's son, John Pierpont Morgan. Yeah, and what became of them? Uh, no idea, Ray. No, well, indeed. Um, <laughs> in in the meantime, all the Morgans uh, moved to the US, leaving the UK bank in the hands of Edward Grenfell, the senior partner, um, and changed the name to Morgan Grenfell in recognition. Yeah, and, and over a period, as, as regulations were gradually relaxed and the business expanded accordingly, Morgan Grenfell became a pretty big name in UK investment banking. Hmm. Until in the 1980s, Morgan Grenfell found itself caught up in a major share trading fraud. The firm ended up paying a large fine and three other defendants went to prison for their crimes. So, Ray, what was the name of the firm involved? Uh, Guinness, Graham. (laughs) Well, what the same Guinness who, like George Peabody, provided social housing for the poor? Well, it was the same family, yeah. Well, that is a weird coincidence. Hmm. Uh, Soon after that, Deutsche bought the bank as it wanted a foothold in the burgeoning London investment banking market. Like a sort of instant access account. Well, yeah, that's one way of putting it. Um, Anyway, the firm continued for a while to trade as Morgan Grenfell before becoming Deutsche Morgan Grenfell and eventually just Deutsche Bank. So so that was the entry into the UK market. Um, Shall we turn to the US? Yes, let's. Uh, Obviously, once the bank had a presence in London, it was likely to be just a matter of time before they showed a desire to enter the massive American market as well. Yeah, but I wonder if people will remember the controversy surrounding the firm that they bought. Well, I suspect not, Graham, or it would probably be mentioned more often. 
Indeed. So, Ray, the firm at the heart of that controversy is... Bankers Trust, Graham. You see, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't resonate as controversial, Ray, does it? Uh, no. Uh, like Morgan Grenfell, Bankers Trust had been around for a while, since 1903, in fact. And it was effectively a Morgan company as well, given that it was largely financed by the Morgan family, and JP Morgan had a controlling interest. They had their fingers in a lot of pies, didn't they? Uh, yes, well, mostly banks, actually. But I dare say they enjoyed a pie, Graham. Who doesn't? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> M- moving on. Um, Bankers Trust consolidated its position in investment banking, eventually giving up all its retail banking branches and focusing on this new and exciting business of derivatives. Mm. And then it all started to unravel. Um In an odd echo of events yet to come, again, uh, Bankers Trust suffered huge reputational damage when some of the complex derivatives it sold to some well-known household names, including uh, Procter & Gamble, um, suffered huge losses, leading to the trust being sued successfully on the basis that the risks and nature of the products had not been adequately explained to them. (laughs) Blimey, where have I heard that before? It gets worse, though. Uh, It then suffered a large loss due to having a large position in Russian government bonds, which, to put it bluntly, tanked. Russian bonds? Well. Mm. And then a bunch of their New York staff were found to have improperly appropriated the funds from dormant accounts and unclaimed dividends, moving them to the operating account illegally for which many were banned or given community service, uh, and for which the bank pleaded guilty. Mm, And that caused them huge fallout because that guilty plea, as I understand it, meant the bank could no longer deal with certain uh, municipalities and, and other types of businesses. And then Deutsche Bank stepped in and bought them. Yeah, for $10.8 billion. That was handy. Uh, Yes, I think it probably was for Bankers Trust. Um, So the growth of Deutsche Bank in both the UK and the US was pretty much on the back of purchases of companies who had both suffered recent and pretty significant uh, reputational damage. And I guess, as we've spoken about before, acquired businesses which, between them, had a bunch of different systems, cultures and clients, which would not necessarily have been easy to integrate. Well, I think that's a reasonable assumption. So DB spread into the English-speaking world through a couple of acquisitions were at best a bit contentious and at worst possibly perilous. Yes, and and then of course they decided to go into Russia as well. A decision that led, in a roundabout way, to the whole mirror trade controversy. Uh, Yes, and which then of course starts throwing out all sorts of coincidences which leads to our third act, President Trump. Shall we begin with a couple of things which happened in the early 2000s which are going to become relevant? Well, let's do that. Uh, Do you want to start? Yeah, why not? Um, Let's begin with um, Josef Ackermann. He joined the board of Deutsche Bank in 2002, not so long after the completion of the Bankers' Trust acquisition. He remained as chairman until 2012 when he handed over to Anshu Jain and Jürgen Fitchen. And what did he do then, Ray? Well, in 2014, he took over as chairman of the Bank of Cyprus. Oh, that's quite a contrast. It is. And according to news reports from the time, his name was put forward by Victor uh, Vexelberg, head of the Renova Group um, and Wilbur Ross. So, So he was effectively sponsored by a man who is now sanctioned by the United States Mm -hmm. and the man who went on to become Donald Trump's trade secretary. If the reporting is correct, yes. Okay, let's come back to that in a minute. But of course, Mr. Trump's financial situation took um, a turn for the worse during Mr. Ackerman's tenure as chairman, didn't it? Mm, Yes, it did. Um, In 2003, according to the New York Times... Deutsche Bank helped Trump sell hundreds of millions of dollars in bonds to finance his casino venture, which Trump's company then defaulted on, leaving a trail of deep losses behind them. According to reports at the time, the bank's investment division vowed not to do business with him again. 
Well, you can hardly blame them. Uh, well, quite. Uh, and yet, according to the report, a year later, another part of the investment division lent him $640 million to build a skyscraper in Chicago. Mr Trump defaulted on that loan as well, uh, but proceeded to sue Deutsche Bank, claiming it was their fault as they'd contributed to the credit crunch which had caused the default. Um, at which point the entire investment bank severed ties with him. But then, three years later, another part of the bank decided uh, to start lending to him instead. Uh, really? Mm, yeah, except this time it was the private banking division. Uh, that's a tad unusual, isn't it? Well, even more surprisingly, again, according to the New York Times, uh, the money they lent um, him was used to repay the loans he defaulted on from the bank's investment division. Hold, hold on, right. Let me see mm. if, if I've got this right, because that sounds a bit weird. So you're saying that one part of Deutsche Bank lent Trump money to repay loans he'd defaulted on from another part of Deutsche Bank? So it's reported. And at the time, no one else wanted to do business with him? So they say. Well, so uh, shall we see what was happening elsewhere in the world at that time? Uh, where were you thinking of, Graham? Well, Ray, I was thinking of Russia. <laughs> because, oh. because, because in 2005, Deutsche Bank acquired uh, what was then a 40% stake in United Financial Group, which was then one of the country's leading brokers, and they bought the remaining 60% the following year. Which went on to become the equity desk in Russia responsible for the mirror trading we've been discussing over the last couple of episodes. Well, yeah. So by all accounts, an American called Tim Wiswell, who was married to a Russian art historian, was working for UFG and made the move to DB on the acquisition. Now, Mr. Wiswell is referenced, albeit indirectly, in the Department of Financial Services of New York's consent order, which is the, the fine for the mirror trades, mm -hmm. um, which at one point states, and I'm going to quote, and it's quite a long quote, so bear with me, a supervisor on the Moscow desk appears to have been paid a bribe or other undisclosed compensation to facilitate the schemes. The supervisor's close relative, quotes, who apparently had a background in historical art and not finance, was also the apparent beneficial owner of two offshore companies, Ray. Um, one each located in the British Virgin Islands and Cyprus, both high-risk jurisdictions for money laundering. Um, carrying on in the quote, in April and again in June 2015, one of the key counterparties involved in the mirror trading scheme made payments totaling $250,000 to one of the companies owned by this close relative, allegedly pursuant to a consulting agreement. Payments to one of these two companies totaling approximately $3.8 million were almost exclusively identified for the purported purpose of financial consulting, and they largely originated from two companies registered in Belize. Um, wow. Graham, I'm going to go out on a limb uh, and say that although he's not named as such in the uh, DFSMY hmm. uh, consent order, uh, there are certain similarities between Tim Wiswell and Mr X in this report. Well, there, there are, which, it, which if entirely coincidental, are extraordinary coincidences. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's do a quick recap. Um, by the middle of the 2000s, Deutsche Bank had significant operations in the UK, uh, the US and Russia. Yes, I mean, we should say lots of other countries as well. Of course, but we're interested in the background to the mirror trade. So we'll focus on these three as they were the main players. They were. Um, they'd acquired UFG, which became the DB Equity Trading Desk in Moscow. It had close ties with a number of brokers who were placing mirror trades with them. Uh, they were. I think we should talk about one of those brokers. Um, anyone in particular? Well, yes, it's called IC Financial Bridge, and it was owned by a guy that we've spoken about before, who's called Alexander Peripolichny. Now, he's the chap who died while out for a jog in Weybridge back in 2012, isn't he? Yes, he is. And not so long uh, before he died and, and after he'd left Russia, he'd gone to the Swiss regulator to blow the whistle on a major money laundering scheme, which he claimed he had been involved in perpetrating. 
uh, and we know from documentary evidence that several of Parapolichny's companies have been involved in moving money in what's become known as the Prevazon case. Well, yes. Um, uh, and we should say that is separate from the mirror trading company Financial Bridge. Now, mm. um, uh, yes, and that case, which was brought but then eventually dropped by the Americans, allegedly involved the theft of some very significant sums of money from the Russian state treasury, some of which allegedly ended up with a Cypriot company, Cyprus again, called Prevazon, and that was owned by a Russian guy called Denis Katsiv. Okay, but Katsiv and Prevazon strenuously deny this though, don't they? Well, they do. And, and in fact, so much so that they hired a Russian lawyer called mm. Natalia Veselnitskaya to defend them against those charges. Ah, now, she's the Russian lawyer who also became a strong advocate against what's become known as the Magnitsky Act, which was the instrument used to apply sanctions against Victor Vexelberg, who we mentioned just now. Yeah, do you think sometimes we're going around in circles here? Mm. Um uh, it did, and and that caused her to end up in a room with Donald Trump Jr. during the 2016 election campaign. Well, indeed. Uh, now, I believe you found another odd connection to Deutsche Bank there, haven't you? Well, possibly. Uh, not definitively, but as far as I can tell, according to news reports, the name of the translator who was in the room at this meeting is a guy called Anatoly Samachornov. Now, he's mm. married to a lady called Tatiana Rodzianko, and I believe she's the brother of Alexis Rodzianko, who was the head of Deutsche Bank Russia until being replaced following the acquisition of USG in 2005. No. Yes, and now, according to the news reports I've read, uh, Rodzianko was hired by Deutsche Bank Russia in 2001. Any other weird connections? Well, yeah, Ray. One of the names linked to the Peripolichny case was a guy called Andrei Pavlov. Ah, now that name rings a bell. Oh, right, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it, it had to be said. Uh, fair play. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Pavlov, we're not feeding dogs, was the, um, well, according to The Guardian here in the UK, Okay, they carried a story saying he was in the UK at the time of Peripolichny's death and flew out the following morning, nudge, nudge. Now, why is Pavlov interesting? Well, obviously, that's an interesting story, but he was close to some of the people named as the perpetrators of the fraud in Russia, which resulted in the Prevazon case. Mm. And then secondly, he was photographed at a meeting of the European Parliament alongside Natalia Veselnitskaya and Renat Akhmetsin, who were both present at the Trump Tower meeting. Hold on. So... This guy Pavlov is linked, according to press reporting, with the death of Alexander Parapolichny, who we know with reasonable certainty owned one company that performed many of the Deutsche Bank mirror trades and others which were used as part of a major money laundering scheme. He, he's also linked with two other people who were in the Trump Tower meeting with Donald Trump Jr. and others, where the translator, and bear with me, um, was married to the sister of the former head of Deutsche Bank Russia, a bank which has a long history of lending to the Trump family when no one else would, allegedly, um, whose former chairman became the head of the Bank of Cyprus at the recommendation of a man who is now sanctioned following the passage of an act which came about due to the major Russian tax fraud which Parapolichny laundered money for and another man who then became Donald Trump's trade secretary. Yup. Blimey. Uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, it, it really was a drama in three acts, not to mention quite a long soliloquy at the end, wasn't uh, it? <laughs> uh, which you performed beautifully. And, <laughs> and yes, um, uh, an act that, let's say, was full of some strange connections and coincidences. Mm, a weird and wonderful journey. Uh, where do we go next, Graham? Well, I think we've come to a neat end for season two. Now, now you mentioned uh, in the past couple of episodes the European Commission report into money laundering, Ray. So I think mm. we should maybe take a short break to recover our uh, mojos um, and <laughs> then kick off the third season with a look at that report in a bit more detail. 
Uh, that's great. And in the meantime, um, we could let people know that we're preparing for the first Dark Money Files live event next month in London. Hopefully, the first of several. Um, and that's going to be hosted by our Lexis Nexus friends. Indeed, it is, Ray. Uh, we'll be on a, a modest stage with a, a live audience, hopefully, and, and possibly even some slides. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Dark Money Files. We hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to listen to future episodes, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or your normal podcast provider. Thanks.